Put your thinking cap on. You've got two of the smartest guys in broadcast engineering up next. Philip Schmid from Nautel. He's the chief technical officer. And Alex Hartman, who works with support in Nautel and dreams up new ways for us to broadcast. It's coming up next on Twerked. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store. With outstanding service, savings, and support. Online at bgs.cc. By Broadcast Bionics. With the Bionic Studio, including talk show control, social media, and visual radio, Broadcast Bionics brings exceptional audience engagement to radio and TV. By Angry Audio. Audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. And by Max Connect Wireless, prioritized high speed internet service designed for transmitter sites and remote broadcasts. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. It's our 550th show. This is the show where we talk about everything from uh, the microphone to that light bulb right there at the top of the tower. I'm Kirk Harnack in the Telos Alliance studio in Nashville, Tennessee. So glad to be here and thankful that Telos gives me a couple hours off once a week to talk to industry leaders and engineers about what's going on in the world of uh, radio technology. And today we've got a program that I'm really excited about because we're going to be learning a lot about digital radio. And, uh, you know, if you follow technology you know digital seems to be the future of just about everything out there and, and radio um well radio's got a, st- a digital story to tell too and in fact at some point we may get rid of some analog radio like they've done with the public broadcasting in uh, in sweden i believe so let's bring in we got two guests today uh we have two guests from nautel to explain about experimentation and on the air stuff stuff that's really happening in uh, digital radio and so first of all let's bring in philip schmidt philip hey good to see you how are you yeah, very good. Thank you for being on the show. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure. You've been on this show before. I think you explained um, d- a digital multicast or something like that. Some Exactly. Uh, yes, yeah. that's, it's been a few years now, but uh, we showed up to uh, 15 audio services, sort of one transmitter, and we'll get back to that in a little bit in the show, too. That's that's actually part of today's presentation, mm-hmm. and then it's expanded to include other technologies. like Absolutely. Like yeah. Okay. Exactly. Good deal. And also from Nautel, from his lair of wisdom, <laughs> it's Alex Hartman. Alex, welcome in. Hey, Kirk, how are you doing? I'm good. It's so good to see you. Good to see you as well. It's been I a while. Ta- I just, well, I just talked to Alex on the phone uh, a couple of days ago, and he gave me some great advice. We're trying to solve an HD. I, you know, I, this stuff is all magic to me, and, and Alex knows what he's doing. So, yeah, you get some Nautel stuff, you get some great advice to go along with it. All right. Uh, so, um, uh Gentlemen, before we really get into the whole presentation, uh, there are some nice people at Nautel. Uh, uh, Fiona Ferguson is one of them. She might be the nicest. That asked me to talk about a couple of things going on at Nautel. Of course, I'll tell you about the Transmission Talk Tuesdays. That uh, it, We'll have that coming up because there's one coming up next Tuesday or this coming Tuesday after the weekend. But they're having a couple of promotions that you might want to be aware of. I'm going to put myself here on uh, full screen. Um, one of them is a free second backup exciter promotion. Is it a second backup or is it the first backup? It's a second exciter. It's a backup. And they're having a promotion that you get a free second integrated redundant exciter on any GV series transmitter. Contact your Nautel rep uh, or go to Nautel.com slash 11 things. And that's spelled one, one things. That, that confuses me. Call your Nautel rep. you got to know who that is. And if you live where I do, it's Jeff Welton, but there's other fine Nautel reps. So that free second backup exciter promotion. And they have another promotion. This one messes with my mind, too. It's called the 4610 VS Savings Promotion. <sighs> we got to simplify this for us simple guys. Um, there's three offers in one. You get $4,000 off the purchase of a VS 2.5 transmitter. Hey, I've got one of these. I love the thing. It's an awesome transmitter. But you get $4,000 off the purchase of that. You can get $6,000 off the purchase of the VH, VS HD Digital Exciter. Okay, so get $6,000 off of that, and you get $10,000 off if you purchase both because of math. So <laughs> 4000 plus 6000 you get $10,000 off if you get a VS 2.5 transmitter and the uh, VS HD digital exciter. Contact your Nautel rep uh, or uh, the website's too kind. Look in the show notes. I'll put the web link in the show notes. And finally, remember they're doing, um, as usual, the uh, the um, uh, Transmission Talk Tuesday roundtable discussions. This is not a one-to-many sort of thing. This is where you get to participate if you want to. You don't have to be on. Uh, but you can ask questions and participate and give your advice uh, this coming Tuesday, June 29th. It's Tips and Thoughts for Contract Engineering. Hey, I was a contract engineer for years, and I could have really used some 
tips and thoughts. I had to learn the hard way and save you a lot of trouble. Maybe you are recently out of a uh, corporate job. Uh, maybe you've just, uh, you're transitioning somehow and you want to go do some consulting. There's a lot of radio stations looking for a contract engineer. And uh, so you should listen to that uh, webcast, that uh, Transmission Talk Tuesday, and check it out. Oh, you need to register for that because it's really easy to do. And the web link for that is, um, is oh, yeah, Nautel.com slash webinars. Nautel.com slash webinars. Easy. Just put in your name and email address, and they'll fix you right up. All right. Let's get back at it here with uh, Philip and Alex. You guys are going to tell us about digital broadcasting, and, and this isn't just replacing an FM station with a digital FM station or a 1 a.m. signal with just 1 a.m. Well, Philip, you want to lead us into this discussion? Tell us what we're going to be looking at. Well, the first thing we thought we'd talk about a little bit is uh, all digital AM, because that's a very hot topic today. Um, and uh, maybe to, to get started with, let's just have a quick look at uh, what the signal looks like, how it's different, um, and then we'll get in some practical installations. So I've got a slide together here, and we don't need to get into all the details. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly on, on the left-hand side, uh, we've got the what we call the hybrid analog AM and HD radio signal all put together in, this, in the frequency domain. In the center, that's where your analog AM would be, um, you know, around your un unmodulated AM carrier. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you've got uh, lower carriers in, on, around that, so they don't interfere with the analog. And then higher ones where the, the, the main part of the, uh, the HD radio signal lies on the outside. 30 kilohertz wide, so it's it's fairly wide, um, but it can support both the analog and uh, the digital channels. Now we've been doing that for you know over a decade now. I mean uh, that's certainly a, a common mode of of operating. Let What's me, now? Let me make sure yeah, go ahead. On, on that on the left hand slide there, the analog portion of the AM is just the the kind of the sliver. In the, I mean not not the sliver between the two green bars, but between the two nearest yellow bars. That yes. is your AM analog signal right there, and and then the digital in the in the hybrid mode takes up all that stuff on the sides. Exactly, the, the blocky ones are all the digital block uh, okay. signal, and uh, the analog, of course, is a, is a little bit more unpredictable depending on the audio modulation. But if you kill the analog, you can go to this other mode. Tell us about about that. Exactly. So if the analog goes away, uh, now we've got all this free space in the center. So what um, Xperia has done is move the outside, uh, the primary carriers in where the analog would have been. So you see that on the right hand side there. So they are at the higher level. And uh, the, the benefit of that is when we turn off the analog AM audio, we can give the digital a lot more power. And uh, Alex will talk a little bit more in a little bit as to what that means for your coverage. Um, so all the primary where the audio lies is in the center, the primary carriers, and then further down, we've got the secondary and tertiaries. That's where typically you would place your artist experience, the, the, the pictures you can put on your car dashboard, um, on, you know, and make it really look like any, any of the other um, digital transmission systems with you know, a full multimedia experience. Those are sitting on the lower carriers. So one thing to take away with that is that your audio will go super far, but some of the uh, the the uh, the art, the, the graphic work may not go quite as far because they're they're related to the outside. The other benefit of that signal is that it's now only 20 kilohertz, so it, it fits more nicely into our channel allocations. Uh, it, it's probably a little bit easier to pass on your antenna and your ATU because it's narrow bandwidth, uh, but it, it's a lot more digital power. So your transmitter needs to take care of that. I, I never realized this in in speaking with. Um uh the station in uh in frederick uh wwfd yep yes yeah that's right. uh, i didn't realize that we get to go from 30 kilohertz of total transmitted bandwidth down to 20 kilohertz yeah exactly oh wow okay that's cool makes it makes it life a little bit easier like uh phil had mentioned you know you don't have to have that much tower and atu uh bandwidth mm -hmm. right okay and the other thing we can do as well as the lower ones we could even turn them off entirely if you want to and get away with 10 kilohertz Mm, okay. If if, ne if necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Wow. All right. That's but of good course, you sacrifice the uh, the pretty pictures when <laughs> doing so. Well, what what do you sacrifice if you got rid of the the, the outer um, module? It's, it's called artist experience. That's the part that you would miss. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that that's lower speed data out there. Uh, well, it's what the you know on the FM side you see it with the station logo or the album art and stuff like that. AM is capable of doing that just the same. Mm. So those outer carriers carry that data. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Very good. Well, um, certainly this new signal is uh, uh, a challenging signal for our transmitters to um, 
to uh, produce faithfully. But what we've shown here on the right hand side is an NX5 uh, uh, producing five kilowatts of uh, uh, all digital. Um, same signal that we've just looked at. And on the left, you can see the signal constellation that carries all the bits. And here we're talking about 64 qualm um, with up to uh, six bits of information per symbol or uh, per carrier. Um, and, um, you know, we can see it's, it's, it's very pristine, very nice and crisp constellations there, 37 dB MER for those that know what that means. Um, and the reason why we can do that is we have a lot of uh, pre-correction built into our NX transmitters. Um, mm. And you can see that on some of the widgets on the right-hand side. And that in and of itself is a deep dive. Uh, so we're just going to leave that that you know, we do a lot of pre-correction, and uh, we we have a few papers on that. That if you want to dig deeper into it. So that, that constellation picture um, mm. is is are we receiving that right off the RF output port? How are you reading that? At what point? Yes, exactly. It's at the output of the transmitter. Okay. It's so if you were out in the field um, and you're transmitting a good constellation, but you're out in the field somewhere, uh, maybe driving down the road, does it actually mess with the constellation or does it make it noisier? What, what's typically happening five, ten yeah. miles away to the constellation? Absolutely. Um, as, you know, as, as environmental noise adds into it, you'll, you'll get a very big fuzzball. And I've seen from, from some of the field measurements that we've been part of with the NAB Fast Road pro Project uh, with All Digital AM, uh, I've seen some pretty bad constellations, yet they still decode perfectly fine. No noise on the audio. Uh, the, you know, the, the signal that, uh, that uh, uh, Xperia Ubiquity came up with, it is pretty amazing of how robust it really is. So I guess uh, I'm, I'm glad you pointed this out that you're picking this up off the uh, off an RF tap because you've you've got to transmit something that's as good as can be done if you want the maximum amount of robustness in reception out in the field. You can't start with something that's messy and expect it to play well in the field, right? Exactly, exactly. And as we found out, you know, with with some of the uh, transfers installed in the field today, that's actually very challenging to achieve. Mm. Uh, we found that not all transmitters can actually broadcast those lower carriers faithfully so you can't even pick up the, those nice pictures that, that we mentioned even into a dummy load uh, forget about you know any of the environmental impacts um, you know a lot of older style transmitters don't have the bandwidth and the pre-correction capability to handle the signal so it's a very challenging signal to broadcast i'm guessing that any transmitter you're offering now for sale any am transmitter is going to be able to do this well right our nx series certainly does that okay. yeah absolutely okay, okay. Yep. cool yeah, and the other thing I want to mention here is, you know, uh, we we have uh, the latest fourth generation uh, encoding equipment in our HD multicast for our NX transmitters. It's shown here, um, and you can see one of the uh, logos that we put on air. Of course, uh, <laughs> we like to put our own logo on when we do a little trials like that. So you see the Nautel logo coming up on one of our receivers. Mm -hmm. um, but again, uh, Nautel is unique in a way that we're the only ones uh, in the AM. Uh, field that adopt that fourth generation uh, um, broadcast uh, equipment. Um, you know, we all started with second generation over a decade ago, but we've upgraded our transmitters to handle the X-Gen modulator that Xperi uh, created that everybody uses in the in the FM uh, domain. But we've been able to adopt it for AM as well, and that allowed us to uh, to bring the latest and greatest to uh, to the AM platform as well. What are we looking at here on the screen in terms of these uh, software dialogue blocks? <laughs> there, there's a lot on there. We don't necessarily need to go into the details of mm -hmm. all of that, but that is the control so control software that runs on the HD multicast. Okay. Um, it is uh, the, you know the 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 application that um, uh, that Xperia essentially uh, distributes to us manufacturers, and on top of that, we also have a web interface that you can control all of these aspects too. If you are um, modulating, uh, uh, or if, if you're if you're encoding and then transmitting a number of uh, audio programs, typically how are they going into this importer exporter box, this HD Multicast Plus box? Well, Alex, maybe that might be a good one for you to handle there. Sure, sure. Uh, traditionally, it's a uh, digital audio require digital radio requires digital audio. So uh, we uh, have a Lynx AES sixteen uh, sound card inside of there uh, for audio capture. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, you can use things like LiveWire uh, as well as a capture source. Okay, so I could have a, mm -hmm. a LiveWire IP audio driver in there and just pull mm -hmm. them off my network. Okay, well, yes. and, and do we want to pull already processed audio in that way? Yes, actually, okay. you do because it is a. You, you think of digital radio as streaming because it really is. So your audio mm -hmm. processor needs to be set up for a lossy codec stream system because uh, that's really what uh, HD and digital radio is. 
Okay. All so right. make sure you're processing appropriately for like you would sending it out to your she who not, shall not be named devices uh, would apply here just the same. I'm guessing we don't want any composite clipping on, on this. No, no, not at all. Okay. Okay. <laughs> all right, Philip, what's next? next? Well, I think uh, maybe the best thing to look at now is how does it behave in the field? And uh, Alex, why don't you talk a yeah. little bit about uh, some of the stations? We've got four stations on the air now. Yep. Mm. So uh, the first one that has really been the trailblazer was uh, WWFD in Frederick, Maryland. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hubbard Station there, Dave Colasar. Uh, I know you've had him on the show here mm-hmm. a few times, Kirk. Um, just really pioneering this uh, field. Uh, and he does have the Nautel transmitter to facilitate that. And uh, Xperia always helps him out uh, in, in running some of their more uh, we'll call them exotic experiments. <laughs> uh, but the uh, the first commercially licensed station uh, actually is WMGG in Tampa, Florida. Uh, this is the first station the FCC authorized outside of an STA. Uh, and it was on an NX3 transmitter. Uh, it is a 2,800-watt day timer. Uh, I think he's 280 watts at night uh, down there. And it's also diplex, just to make it even more interesting. Hmm. So he's got an all-digital system that's diplexed. Uh, here on the map, you can see what would be a traditional map that you get from the FCC, uh, you, showing your two millivolt meter on the AM side and the inner circle there, and then your half millivolt per meter on the outside there. The you know a lot of guys who are traditional in a- analog AM will drive out to their half millivolt, and the signal is just terrible, unusable. Mm-hmm. You know, it's in the noise. Uh, but because of digital cliff. You can drive all the way out to the 0.5 millivolt, and it's still crystal clear because it's digital audio. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, like Phil said, that pre-correction, keeping those constellations nice and clean, allow for the robustness to get through all the noise in the urban jungle or environmental or whatever. And, and proof positive here uh, from uh, Neil Ardman, the owner of the station here. I've talked to him a couple of days ago. He went from an eight-mile listenable coverage on that signal to 35 miles. Wow, that, that's daytime, right? Yes, that's daytime okay. coverage. Yeah. Okay. Um, but in turn, that added a lot of things to his ability because it's a music station too. Mm-hmm. So he's playing uh, Motown on this station. Or no, I'm sorry, MGG is not Motown. That one is Spanish Hits. Okay. Um, but having that 35 mile coverage covering the entire Tampa, Tampa Bay area um, just drew in listeners. And oh, guess what? his PPM started decoding a lot better. Oh, okay. okay because there's so, no noise. Yeah, yeah. So so PPM, um, uh, that's the uh, personal people meter. That's yep, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, Nielsen uh, Nielsen en- encoding. Uh, that are, that's some tones that are supposed mm-hmm. to be subaudible. Not everybody would say they are. Uh, <laughs> but they, uh, they travel along with the audio in a frequency range that's in the middle of our hearing range. And... Um, uh, so you're it's, uh, uh, and so which happens to be the same range where statics noise is. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. But, so, but so, in so, AM so, world, you're now you're listening to a stream. So those uh, the, the the receivers for the PPM markets can hear it. So I take it those tones make it through the uh, audio, the, the lossy audio compression. Right, right. Okay. Uh, the, the comparison would be, uh, he showed me a map there of uh, his, his ratings there. Uh, the two weeks leading up to him flipping from all analog to all digital, mm-hmm. uh, he had a cum of 50,000 when he was in pure analog. He okay. had a cum of 98,000 the first week he went to digital. Wow. Almost and- double. What, would you, and you may not know the, the business story behind this, but uh, is, is Tampa a particularly high market for percentage of car radios that have HD? Yes, it, it is, is actually a high HD penetration market. Okay, okay. So well, we're, still, we're still talking losing half your listeners, yet your camera went up through the roof. So yeah. that's a very strong story. Yeah. I got to believe not only if, if your cum goes up, but I, since it's digital audio and and it certainly sounds in many ways better than the analog AM. I mean, you may find an instance or two where you could argue that the analog AM sounded better in some way. I, that's a, that's right. a personal preference. But I would think the time spent listening would go up. It did. Um, he Ooh, actually said okay. he's number one for TSL now. Uh, but here's the law of unintended consequences, Kirk. Mm-hmm. By simply him turning it on and advertising the fact that he went all digital, mm-hmm. a lot of people started hunting around the AM band again. They all came back and said, what else is going on over here? Hmm. Hmm. So not only did his interest level go up because he was doing something different, 
But while you're there, you're looking around. It's like going to the store for, you know, spark plugs. But, hey, uh, what about oil change? You know, you, you look around. So uh, it seems that the audience, just by having it there, mm-hmm. is looking around and bringing everybody up just the same. So it was a very interesting yeah. Um, yeah. social experiment, really. Philip, what's uh, what's next before we uh, take our first break? What, what you got? Well, um, now we, we we're going to look at uh, some more international applications of okay. all digital okay. radio, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll go for a little trip around the world. Go right ahead. All right. Um, so the uh, one thing to look at is internationally uh, another standard that's all digital is uh, Digital Radio Mondial. Um, you know, at high level, very comparable to the MA3 all digital mode, um, mm-hmm. and it's it's originally designed to be all digital. That's the the, the plot on the left uh, with just a block. Um, then, but of course, we we can also combine it with what they uh, call a simulcast. Um, where you can still maintain an, an, an analog signal along with the digital. And then they also have modes that widen the signal, uh, but they're all at the same level this time, rather than a sort of a, a, a pyramid step that we had with, with MA3. Hmm. And uh, it, it gets even more uh, data capacity in those modes. Okay. My so, favorite part of this is that that center picture is actually running at 400 kilo, kilowatts. Kilowatts, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, 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 little, I'm, little out of the U.S. scope there. That's a b- lot if, of power. If I'm in the U.S., can I apply for an Indian license and have it here? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the next one to look, uh, talk about here is a two megawatt project in Hungary. <laughs> oh, my uh, And we did actually light up uh, D- DRM uh, for some time, and uh, it probably was receivable halfway across the world. With, uh, with that sort of power level. Um, now, they're running analog for most of the time, but certainly uh, that was something they wanted to uh, experiment with, and uh, pretty cool installation there. Um, we've got a couple more pictures here with uh, all the coils and everything. In that case, it was uh, uh, five 400 uh, kilowatt transmitters all combined together. Uh, you can see our combiner on the right here. You know, you see the nice little two megawatt symbol on there. <laughs> um, it, it was a pretty, pretty cool uh, project. Um, and uh, to see that running a, a digital radio signal on top of that, uh, pretty impressive. When wow. you, when they when they lit that up, uh, you know the sparks were certainly flying up and down the the guy wires, and uh, uh, quite the experience. Yeah, I've heard stories. You can't be near the actual tower uh, when this thing's actually on because it'll reach out and say hi. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh man. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Um, another um, a project in the AM band certainly is India. Uh, we've uh, fielded thirty three uh, DRM. Uh, are capable uh, NX transmitters of various power levels. Uh, most of them all very high power levels between 50 and uh, 300 kilowatts. Um, and they're uh, initially they're they're doing the simulcast with the analog maintained into it. But uh, over the last year, uh, they've turned more and more or departed more and more of them for all digital as well. Um, one of the big things they're broadcasting over there now is cricket games uh, over over AM, and that seems to be very popular. Mm, um, okay. And uh, so that's that's what we uh, <laughs> yes exactly. I know. Look at that map. Yeah, here's a map of all my uh, 300 kilowatt transmitters, <laughs> and here's all my 200 kilowatt transmitters. And I tell uh, you and what, my, and these are just my little 100 kilowatters in the small towns. <laughs> and I tell you what, Kirk, they can have that power bill. <laughs> oh, oh man. Okay. Yeah, no, uh, um, certainly an exciting project, and uh, it's it's interesting to see that uh, you know there's momentum moving forward into uh, digital radio over there as well. Uh, those transmitters were all um, modulated by Digidia modulators and content servers, and uh, mm-hmm. pretty cool project to be part of. And this is DRM; it's not HD radio. Uh, what what do you know about the availability of DRM radios there? You know, small appliance type radios. <laughs> Yeah, certainly it's, uh, I, I believe they're now talking about three to four million cars on the road uh, mm-hmm. with DRM receivers mm-hmm. um, in the AM band. Um, and uh, it's, it's it's still a little bit slow going, but there's lots of models out there. Um, you know, we, we see uh, receiver models from Gospel and uh, and other manufacturers uh, getting into marketing, including some native uh, Indian uh, manufacturers as well. It's picking up, but it is slow going, I do have to say. Amazing, amazing! I can't wait to get a, you know a DRM radio to uh, to hang across uh, the the back of the neck of my elephant, my uh, <laughs> uh, my camel, because I've seen those there, or or just you know have it installed in in the uh, rickshaw or whatever you would call them, you know. But I've ridden in one of those in India. Mm. Wow, 
If they're yeah. own batteries because they don't have electrical system. Yeah, they're, 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 for their tests for a lot of things, they've got um, a truck that they ride around with that has a lot of little tabletop radios. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. okay. Wow. All right. So the next thing that's uh, that's happening in, in, in India is now that they've, they've looked at, at the medium wave band AM and uh, looked into that. Now, the big question is, what should we do for the FM band? Yeah. Uh, and certainly they're very interested in moving towards the digital space. Uh, and, you know, the regulator there has already endorsed, yeah, we can certainly go digital in the FM band if they've given the green light for that. But the big question is, what is the best standard to use? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, between HD radio, DRM, and even some other standards like Rabbis have been considered. Um, so we've been part of quite some extensive testing uh, over you know, the last year, both for HD radio and DRM, uh, both on, in this case in the FM band. So it might, have a, it might be good to just have a quick look, see what, in the FM band now, how the different standards compare. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're running HD radio today, you're probably familiar with the, the one on the left, uh, with the FM in the middle, the, the mm -hmm. triangle being the FM. Now, certainly, if you have a, a good audio processor, you can change that triangle more into a um, uh, almost like a rectangle kind of shape, but mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, typically it's more like a triangle. But again, the HD radio uh, sidebands are the, the squares okay. uh, on each side. Um, now, a digital radio mondial in the FM band was originally intended or was initially designed to be pure DRM, they call it. Uh, no FM in there at all. That's already all digital. Uh, that's in the center there. And typically, you can get up to three audio services in there, uh, depending on configuration of, of course. Um, and one thing that's really different between DRM and HD radio potentially is that it is very configurable. Uh, you've got many different modes, many different ways of getting audio on there, um, uh, different bandwidth configurations, different robustness modes. Uh, it's a very configurable standard. Hmm. Okay. Um, and on the right-hand side, again, uh, it's similar to HD radio then is the idea that, well, we can broadcast both uh, an analog and a digital signal from um, a single transmitter. Uh, but you can see here that, that it's only a, a single sideband on, on the right-hand side. Uh, as opposed to two and a left. Gotcha. Okay. Mm. All right. Any, any idea which way they're leaning, or is that uh, just not going to be revealed until a uh, decision is made? We're waiting. Um, it, it is really tough to say, and it's a very tough decision. Both both standards are very good, um, mm -hmm. and they both they all performed really well. Um, so you know, it's it, it, it's it's not an easy decision to make by any stretch of the imagination. On that DRM simulcast mode, where you have an analog carrier, this is FM. You have an analog yep. FM carrier there, shown in the center of uh, the center uh, graticule on the spectrum analyzer, and then off to one side, you've got the DRM that it, uh, might in might include I don't know a simulcast of the analog plus up to a couple other audio programs. Um, would receive would DRM receivers uh, be smart enough to? tune the analog and, and then switch over to the digital? Or is right. that even necessary in DRM? Well, it's a little bit different in HD radio. HD radio is very linked but between the FM and the HD1. Uh, it's always a simulcast. It's always the same program. Receivers automatically blend over. Mm -hmm. um, in the DRM world, they have alternate frequency systems uh, where you can point to, it doesn't even have to be on the same band. Hmm. You could point, you know, you can point a, an, an alternate frequency into the DAB band if you wanted to. So, a listener could, for example, in a city, listen to a DAB radio uh, service. The, the receiver could seamlessly switch over to DRM and the FM band as they drive out further or to, to the next town over, or eventually even over to AM. Um, so, you know, they, they've got a fairly sophisticated uh, handover to various services. And it, can, and it can also pass back to the FM as well. Is part of the metadata then uh, a list of alternate frequencies? You'd think yes. it would have to be. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Right. Cool. They do right. a lot of stuff with their metadata compared to the HD stuff, which is very interesting for a lot of reasons. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one interesting part, for example, is uh, that they're now getting into distance education uh, with, um, you know, with essentially they've got a system called Journaline that allows you to effectively transmit web pages to your radio. Um, so now they're demonstrating the the idea that well we could transmit portions of a textbook to a smart receiver, mm -hmm. and we could now, particularly in COVID times where students can't go to school, uh, and still in, in many parts of the world, that might be an effective way to uh, uh, keep schooling going. Uh, I think that's a very exciting uh, concept that uh, that's part of that standard. Well, hopefully the receivers are cheaper than laptops. <laughs> 
And, and, it's so is the, and so is the connectivity. The connectivity is free because it's just in the ether. It's, yep, it's just there. All exactly. Right. What, what, what next, Phil? Any more for this uh, section? Okay. Well, um, just like uh, on the AM side where we looked at all digital, well, um, back in 2015, we've, uh, and that's why I've been on your show before at that time, mm -hmm. we presented an, an all digital solution that took H in the FM band uh, that takes three HD radio signals and broadcasts them out of one transfer here. Okay. Uh, and if you remember that demo that we showed at NAB in 2015, it turned quite a few heads, very interesting. Uh, we've, um, we've, we've trialed it in um, uh, Las Vegas in 2018 mm -hmm. um, at uh, KKLZ, um, and it, it worked for very well there. Um, and uh, as you can see, well, um, it, you know, it, it, this is where the war story comes in, and maybe I'll pass it back to uh, to Alex here because he's he's got a good way to telling this. Yeah, <laughs> All right. and, th and this is, by the way, uh, uh, we haven't done one in a while, but uh, we used to do war story episodes on episode numbers divisible by ten. This is episode mm. five fifty, so it's divisible yeah. by ten. There you, <laughs> go. you have something you want to tell us uh, about about Alex real quick? Well, uh, war stories, ooh, uh, plenty of them. Uh, always check your air conditioners. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, not not for the fact of cooling, but what's living inside of them. Uh, went to an air conditioner uh, fault a uh, couple weeks ago for a customer and uh, found a nest of several birds had taken residence inside the coils outside. Uh, oh. They really didn't like it and all the twigs and sticks. and, and bit, They're sizable birds, so they brought in some pretty big sticks, and they actually seized up the fan. Uh, oh. And that's why it turned off and tripped the breaker. Uh, so of all the silly things that you can find – birds turned off an air conditioner bird. usually it's snake stories i haven't heard of a bird story in quite a while yeah. or wasps bees in the feed mm. horn you know bees in the feed happened. horn everybody's yeah. got those this time of year and it's been ridiculously hot lately so they're out in force philip uh i think we have another, another slide or two before we wrap this yeah. section up what you got here so this right. is my war story oh, okay. i think yeah. for for this oh, particular this portion okay. here sure so when we were testing uh, the HD multiplex there that uh, Philip had developed there, mm -hmm. uh, we demonstrated that in India as well. Well, this also happened during COVID. Uh, and as anybody has been following the news, India has been very hard hit by COVID. Uh, so we had no physical access to the transmitter. I was in Minnesota. Phil was in Halifax. Uh, and if they call us up uh, Friday at 3 p.m., saying, hey, we want to test this here in India. Okay. Uh, uh, and I can never pronounce the name of, t of the town where it is. Uh, but the, uh, but we, have to, we want to do it Monday morning. What? It, it, right. We want to show <laughs> 15 to 18 audio services on a transmitter that we have no physical access to, a laptop and a 4G modem. And had, go. Had this particular <laughs> transmitter ever done this HD multicast before? Nope. So, not like that. No, nope. not like that. No. I, I'm guessing it, it had the right hardware. Did did that transmitter have the right firmware? Did that was a trick. Ah. <laughs> that was a trick. So th there was a laptop on site, but the you know they shut down for the weekend, so there's literally no physical access. Our mm. our man in our man in country could not physically access the transmitter for mm. the weekend. Mm -hmm. So of course they call us quitting time at four o'clock, and say we want to do this Monday morning India time. Uh, to demonstrate to the Ministry of Communications. So Phil and I are like, sure, whatever. Uh, and we came up with our, you know, the things we had demonstrated before for virtual HD radio, uh, AWS to the rescue. And, and I set up a software VPN through several AWS instances talking back to that one HD multicast plus to feed the one transmitter and pulled it off without a hitch amazingly. Wow. Right. And so what kind of signal is that uh, in the yellow lines and the red lines? That's, well, that's, that's IP, but what's the format of that signal? It's actually the E2X. E2X. Okay. So it's it's each individual radio station. You can see there on the left, you know, you got one for 100.6, one for 100.7, and then the local machine was handling the 100.8. So it, it was taking care of all the interleaving, and we had to bring up two different ones to get our goal of, was it 15 stations, Phil? Yeah. Uh, so 15 stations with all the metadata and all the, all the bells and whistles to offer with HD uh, full digital. 
uh, again, 36 hours, and we had to have this on the air to, to, to demonstrate. Mm -hmm. So we ran this. Uh, the cool part was is that we were able to, because of the nature of the way that the HD data works, and we had it running in a VPN in the cloud, mm -hmm. we then linked it to our lab transmitter in Halifax so it would mirror exactly what was happening in India so we could monitor it. So they were both getting the same data, uh, running in Amazon Web Services, okay. running in Mumbai. Uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> so we were doing this half a world away, mimicking it in, oh, and all the audio was originating from my house on my Liveware notes. What? So, yeah. <laughs> and streaming. What? So, the, so the programming is all coming from your house. Yeah. <laughs> and and and, the, and then you're sending that up to AWS Amazon Web Services, where yep. you're crunching the data and putting it in the E2X format, so, so it's uh, ready yep. to go in processed the transmitters. And, and, and yeah. processed and formatted and sent out to the respective transmitters, and we two, received it back. Two different transmitters. Two different okay. transmitters to verify that we did our job right and let it go. One of, one of the transmitters <laughs> Phil could listen to, right? Yep. Exactly. Yeah. And I could too. I could, I could, we have a, a Innovatic Sophia in this oh. factory that I can yeah. tune into and listen to. So we both were able to, to capture the data of what they were experiencing in India. Oh, gee. And of course, uh, our, our, our guy in country there uh, sent us a couple of video snippets back of, you know, his radio, tabletop radio of it working Monday morning. Wow. Uh, needless to say, um, Ministry of Communication was highly impressed with that. Guys, we are uh, moving through the show here, and uh, it's about time we need to take a, a break. Uh, Phil, uh, during this break, uh, kind of figure out what are some of the highlights you want to hit over the next, oh, um, uh, 30 minutes or so. That's about as long as we're going to be able to go. And uh, so this has been fascinating so far. I'm not saying we've gone too slow. This is great. Uh, but we, we've, we're going to have to... Uh, Speed it up. Um, it's <laughs> <laughs> Phil Schmidt, uh, Philip Schmidt with um, uh, Nautel and Alex Hartman with Nautel are both with us here. Philip, you are, I didn't introduce you properly. You are what, the chief technology officer at, at Nautel? Exactly. That's what they call me here. But that just means they, you know, I'll do everything. <laughs> that, that, mean, that means your toys cost more. And, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, and uh, Alex, what's uh, your title at Nautel? Technically, I'm a customer service technologist. So uh, you, when you when you have a problem, you call me and I give I read the manual to you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. Hey, we'll be back in just a minute. We're going to talk about a couple of cool things like this. I've been holding on to this. And it's kind of warm. I've been holding on to it. This is from Angry Audio, one of our sponsors here. AngryAudio.com is the website. And if you go to AngryAudio.com, one of the products you'll see is this, the Bluetooth Audio Gadget. The Bluetooth audio gadget. By the way, the way they name things at uh, at Angry Audio, gadgets are, are bigger things that do more, and gizmos are little things that still do a lot, but they're li littler. So gadgets and gizmos. This is a gadget, the Bluetooth audio gadget. This is for putting into your studio, at your radio station or at your home studio, a podcast studio. This is for connecting your phone to your audio console in the most professional manner you possibly could. Of course, you could wire this up to your um uh, up to your audio console, analog or AES, uh, analog ins and outs, AES out. But if you want to just, you know, put this in a studio and make it part of, let's say, your live wire network, so you could pick it up in any studio. That's one way you could do it. There's a spring-loaded switch on the front right here. Listen to it spring-loaded, and that's what you use to put it in the pairing mode. It's smart enough, and this is really great, smart enough to use the two different modes that Bluetooth can use from a phone. One of them is two-way communications, so it's low latency, and but the audio quality is a little bit lower. It's intended for a phone conversation. You can also uh, put it in the, uh, if you're going to play some audio from your phone, let's say you've done an interview or you've, maybe you've got some songs or some videos on your phone, you want to play the audio back, uh, it'll automatically play back in a higher quality mode, 20 kilohertz of audio over Bluetooth. And this is just really the cat's meow. This is the way to do it. And remember uh, that Angry Audio is the place to get all of your supplies for Studio Hub. There's some Studio Hub supplies right there. And I'm going to, I'm going to bring, um, I'm going to bring uh, Alex back in here because I think he's got a picture of some kind of Studio Hub stuff. Alex, you ever use this Studio Hub stuff? Uh, if, if are, are you muted? I don't know. Maybe you're muted. I didn't hear you say anything. Oh, there okay, we go. There you are. 
Yeah, I use it all the time. Life lifesaver stuff. The, the, you, you just showed the one that I like. That's the one. I'm, I'm the, the one that's got the female RJ on it, and then you yep. plug in whatever length of Cat Five you need. You know, one foot long, one hundred feet long. There you go. Yep. And then, but they have it. They have it with the RJ forty five already on there. If you want to connect, let's say uh, an AES output from a from a, a, a node, uh, an mm -hmm. X node, to the input of let's say an Omnia processor, uh, an mm -hmm. older Omnia processor that doesn't have live wire. You can just do it with that cute little cable. My right favorite there. to use of that is the HX twos. Ah, that's a good idea. Yeah, so that 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 would be analog there, but just on the, just on the yep. one channel. Cool. All right. Th thanks for participating. We'll go back to mm -hmm. me now. <laughs> To angryaudio.com. Check them out. Angryaudio.com. When you call your dealer to buy Angry Audio, if you're going to buy some uh, adapters like these to wire up your studio, be sure you ask for the Studio Hub ones and not the knockoffs. Hey, our show is also brought to you in part by our friends at Max Connect Wireless. Here's Gary Moore. I'm Gary Morrill, Midwest Regional Director of Engineering for Alpha Media. When I first spoke with Josh Bone about Max Connect, he told me they'd work great for remote transmitter sites where connectivity was a challenge. And you know, he's absolutely right. We even have sites where we're using this as a backup to our STL using Max Connect's dual carrier option, and it works perfectly. We also have times where we need to be able to get out to a venue where it's kind of challenging because everybody and his brother is trying to stream video at the same time, like at a big sporting event. And you know what? Our data gets through every time because it's prioritized packet data. It works for us. It'll work for you. Max Connect. Check it out. Thanks a lot, Gary and Morrill, talking about Max Connect Wireless. You can check them out at their website, maxconnectwireless.com. I know it's spelled funny. It's in the show notes just below this video right here. Unless you full screened it, then you have to unfull screen it, then it'll be there. Really cool stuff from Josh Bone. All right, uh, let's bring our guests right back in here, Phil Schmid and uh, and Alex Hartman. All right, Phil, um, you got more for us. I got to ask you to move along. We could we could do a two hour show. We could. <laughs> We we could do a, a series of shows. Who knew digital would be such a big world? <laughs> yeah, I I I, I, I got to tell you, it was back in what was it? The early nineties. What year was the NAB show held in Atlanta? Because the uh, Las Vegas Convention Center was under remodeling. Early nineties, I think. Maybe late eighties, early nineties. Yeah, it's before my time in the industry. And so we'll I, I was that. on the show floor with uh, my then uh, employee partner, uh, Robert Benjamin, and we um, uh, we were looking at the Gentner booth, and uh, there was a demo going on. The th remember the three-line uh, Gentner phone line extender? Three phone oh, lines, yeah. you got 7.5 kilohertz of audio, because they, they shifted it down, yep. and then ran it through yep. the phone line, and shifted it back up. And nope. and and um, uh, they were a guy from Gettner was describing this to a couple of farm broadcasters from Iowa, and one of them was wearing cover hauls, and the other one was wearing overhauls. And mm. you know the difference, you know what I'm talking about. Got done with the uh, demo, and one farm broadcaster turns to the other and says the most prophetic words I've ever heard. He says, "You know, it's here digital's the coming thing." <laughs> <laughs> Yep, it is. So, 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 Phil and Alex, treat us to some more coming thing here. <laughs> like it or not, it's here to stay. We've just talked about the uh, the India uh, setup that we've done here. Um, mm -hmm. But you, one thing I want to highlight there as well is we can do the exact same on HD radio as well as DRM. Uh, HD radio on the left here, we've just looked at that, 15 audio services. We can put up to five or six DRM uh, uh, blocks together just the same mm -hmm. and uh, pack an awful lot of audio into that as well. And what they were really interested in is to see if we can put that in between 800 kilohertz spaced FM allocations. You can see the spectrum shot on the left. Uh, and yes, we're, you're able to, put, to fill this gap in with digital, whether that's HD or DRM, and uh, and really get a lot more audio through um, those uh, channel allocations. Wow. And you don't run into the FMs that are there. Right. No no impact on the FMs as noted. Exactly. You, you guys are turning into the Baskin Robbins of FM radio channels here. You know Baskin Robbins with 31 mm. flavors? Well, see, Kirk, the way I saw it was, look at that spectrum analyzer shot. I think I see a building that looks a little <laughs> bit like that down like, in your neck of the woods. It looks like the Bat Building in Nashville, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, good gosh. Yeah. It's yeah. Cool. Now all we need is the Eye of Sauron between the two things mm -hmm. there. And uh, anyway... <laughs> 
<laughs> Give me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Give me, what kind of modulation would that be? Yeah, that's, the, that's the evil modulation. Mm, mm, now you give us a challenge. <laughs> One modulation <laughs> to rule them all. Okay. That's, right. that's kind of exactly. But, you know, to come back to your uh, flavors example, I mean, language is a perfect example. For oh, this, of course, know? yeah. Give yeah. each channel each, uh, its own language, and India has lots of languages. So yeah. perf perfect application for that. Now let's bring it a little bit closer to home. Uh, mm -hmm. All of this, all digital stuff, and uh, uh, some of the things we're doing a little bit more closely with HD Radio S, you know and love it today. Um, so we've, and you're probably aware of the uh, the webinar series we've done in September about uh, you know innovation and the HD Radio Air Chain. Mm -hmm. uh, and one thing that uh, is plaguing a lot of broadcasters today is the diversity delay alignment between the FM and the HD one. When the receiver blends from FM to HD1, if, if the two audio streams are not aligned, you'll either skip words, you add words, um, if, it's, if it's that far out, or even if it's close in, you'll hear either a, a quick mute, depending on the audio phasing, or even some artifacts um, mm -hmm. whenever the, the receiver goes back and forth. So the specifications for HD radio says, thou shalt be within three audio samples of the two broadcast streams. Um, and that's about 68 microseconds. Uh, very tough to achieve. Um, so one of the, 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 the pieces of equipment that we use is the Enovonix uh, Justin 808 to measure the, the diversity delay between the FM and the HD1. Great product for that. Uh, and on the left, you can see without uh, care of synchronization, it, it can drift all over the place. Sure. And it, it drifts out of, out of that three sample uh, window very, quite often. Even with 10 megahertz, it can still be challenging to be into that, that window, depending on your setup. Um, and there's, there's many, many um, pointers that the NRC is working on in the guideline to, uh, to make sure your, your broadcast plant is synchronized to so keep that as aligned as possible. Uh, but it is a very significant challenge. It looks worthwhile to point out, uh, if, if I'm not wrong here, that the scale, the, the X scale on the right-hand graph is, is much uh, more um, expanded than the exactly. left-hand graph. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's why the three, the plus minus three samples is much larger, showing, but just zoomed in to show you that uh, with exciter synchronization, you're much more likely to, to hit that three samples. Exactly. That's okay. exactly right. Yeah, you'll cool. stay in that window a lot closer. Okay. So that's one of the challenges that uh, prevented us from truly moving into a software world for HD radio air chain. Uh, mm -hmm. because, because in order to get this tight synchronization, uh, that's where you need all the, the, the physical equipment, uh, 10 megahertz signals plugged in, GPS plugged in, and it really ties you into the hardware world. So we wanted to solve this problem to see if we can move a lot of that radio air chain into the virtual world. Like we've just seen in India where we've moved it into AWS, that's only possible with uh, by removing some of these constraints. Okay. Um, but how do we deal with that in, in a normal FMHD broadcast? That's what we addressed in our webinar series last September, and uh, you can find that on our website. Um, and uh, it's particularly the, the last one. Uh, we, it was a three-part series. Um, and the last one is, 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 you know, explains all the sort of things we've been doing. So let's get into that a little bit now. Um, so the, the cloud porter, as we called it in the center here, is what we've used in India. Um, and in that case, we only applied it to the HD streams it's themselves, but we can uh, also throw in FM MPX composite into the transmission as well. Oh, and that, oh so your analog mm -hmm. can ride along with the signal. Exactly. Oh. exactly. And that's how we maintain the time alignment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if there are di different streams, different uh, transport mechanisms, you have different time of flight, uh, you have different uh, synchronization issues, but if you keep them all locked together from that audio processor all the way to the transmitter, we can maintain perfect time alignment. Um, and You never uh, let the problem happen in the first place. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is really uh, what allowed us to get rid of the hardware dependency that's in the equipment today and move this piece of software right into the Amazon Web Services cloud. But certainly, we, we didn't stop there. Um, and uh, you know, some of the pieces of, of equipment, just a screenshot here, you know, the audio processor on the left, uh, the web interface of the uh, HD equipment next, our, our transmitter. And we've had two receivers here looking at the signal that Justin 808 that I mentioned earlier, as well as their Sophia streaming receiver to actually listen to it. So take, putting all this stuff together, uh, Alex cloned this cloud software four times. And we put it in different 
zones in the AWS uh, ecosystem. Okay. And, and you can probably talk more about this, Alex, because you've set it all up. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the cloud never fails until it fails, right? Uh, <laughs> and remember, the cloud is just someone else's computer. But the, uh, the, the first setup that we did was uh, high availability is what the cloud terminology is, where you have two of the same service running, and if something happens, the, the cloud systems know how to shift your data to the one that is running and not the one that is down, i.e. high availability. Uh, so Cloud Porter 1 and 2 there are running in what's called a high availability load balancer. So it would automatically, I, we, we proved this in that webinar where you, we manually rebooted the machine remotely to simulate a failure of AWS East uh, 2B and it failed over to Ohio 2A didn't blink but but then it does it, it, it took a second saying hey wait we need to go back here uh and then cloud porter 3 was in portland which when we demonstrated this remember uh the the west coast was literally on fire at that time yeah, yeah. so this is a actually a very real simulation type of thing where where uh, the 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 oregon aws cloud data center was under threat of burning down hmm. um so what if i wanted to move my data somewhere else so we just for fun to see how bad it would get uh -huh. i cloned it down to sao paulo brazil oh, oh my goodness okay and it, the, the the diversity never slipped once as it moved around hmm. yeah it's very impressive hmm. so as you can see now this is applicable to our hybrid hdf analog uh systems today broadcast transmitters today and it has applicability to all digital um, mm -hmm. So I think this is, in the end, we want to come up with a transmitter where, where all you do is punch in an IP address to go to, and it's going to get all its content from there. We want to make it that simple. Mm -hmm. So it looks like you've, you've, you've virtualized the audio processing and your cloud porter technology, right? That, that mm -hmm. combines the analog and, and all the digital programs. Right. Well, well, Kirk, the one thing that I've mm -hmm. always been good at is taking a basket full of goodies that don't have no business being in the same basket together, <laughs> putting them in the same basket and making them all work. <laughs> so the, the war story here is uh, I, I came to uh, the TELUS Alliance headquarters in Cleveland uh, not too long before uh, my employment at Nautel. Mm -hmm. and I had, had a nice lunch with Frank Foti. And he brought up the fact, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could solve this problem, make HD and FM all in one thing? Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, that'd be cool. Um, you know, and I had to wrap my brain around what he was asking for. And I'm like, okay, I think I get it. And then I get hired by Nautel. I go up to Halifax for a uh, new employee orientation and Phil catches me. And he's like, hey, I've got this idea. And he tells me exactly, wouldn't it be cool if we could put all this FM and HD into one little protocol? And I'm like, did you talk to Frank last week? <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh and, and that's kind of where the brainchild really stemmed from is that this had a very big interest for everybody involved and uh so it, it's more of a labor of love to prove the prove the point that we can do this so uh, you so I, I see the parts that are virtualized in amazon web services aws mm -hmm. is there any reason why you couldn't also Put a cloud-capable automation system in the same area and have absolutely. That. Oh, okay. Oh, so, in in your test here, are you sending audio maybe from your lab uh, up yep. to the, these cloud things? And, well, we have. Uh, there was one that was running um, one of the machines. We had a local instance of Zeta running. Mm -hmm. We also had Radio Jar, which is an online DJ radio station. Oh, you showed system. this in the previous slide. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So, and then a couple of streams that again originated from my house. This is pre-figuring out how Livewire worked in this world. So we were limited to uh, uh, streaming inputs uh, when we did the demonstration. We've yeah. since figured that part out. Yeah. Um, yeah. But th there's no reason why it also has to live in the cloud because the last step there over on the, the Nautil HQ side is a real machine that we finally did fail over to. Should the whole cloud, you lose your internet connection. You know, uh, you know Uncle Bob came home a little too late from the bar one night, hit the pole, took out your internet connections. Mm -hmm. eh, we, we still got you. So, you know, it, it was still there getting all the same data uh, whole... from the local machine. So it doesn't matter if it's in the cloud or sitting next to you on-prem. That Uncle Bob, that Bob's your uncle guy can, can be good. Bob is bad. your uncle, I tell you what. <laughs> we, we guys, we got to take a quick break. Hold your, hold your thoughts, and we're going to come right back in, uh, in, in just a minute. Uh, we are on this week in Radio Tech episode 550 with Alex Hartman and Philip Schmid, both from Nautel, looking at technology and the way some things are just going to be done in the future. And so, uh, our show this week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by our friends over at. Um, 
Broadcast Bionics. Camera One from Broadcast Bionics. Designed to bring video to your audio content. Visualizing radio and podcasts for social media. Camera One can automatically create, capture and brand professionally switched video for live streaming or upload, making your production shareable. Control and configure using a web browser on any device. Camera One is available as a 4-camera or 8-camera system using the Blackmagic A10 Mini range, including the A10 Mini Extreme. You can use cameras to suit your studio and your budget. You'll need one camera for a studio wide shot and usually one camera per microphone. A standard multi-channel sound card or IP driver monitors audio from each studio microphone and we work natively with Axia systems. Ideally, this will be a post-fader feed from each mic, although you can use pre-fade audio or a mic split if that's all you have available. These audio levels are used to intelligently switch the video feed when each contributor is talking. You can also group microphones together into one shot and use the audio from a mixer's aux bus. You can use Camera One's auto switch feature or disable it and switch using the on-screen buttons or the buttons on the ATEM. Recordings can automatically start when you tell the system you're on the air. This on-air indication can be linked to your studio's red lights via IP or an Avantech Adam GPIO interface. You can quickly browse all the videos that have been automatically created during your broadcast, download them and post. Camera One is a user installable system. You'll need a good spec Windows 10 PC, i7 with plenty of storage and 16 gig of RAM. It's better if this machine isn't used for anything else. Remember, you can control the software in a web browser on another device on your network. Camera One, a thrifty way of creating scroll-stopping video from your show or podcast from Broadcast Bionics. And you can go to bionic.radio, bionic.radio to go to Broadcast Bionics, or just search them up on the web, and you'll find all kinds of products uh, for your radio station, uh, cameras, phone systems, uh, uh, the, 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 all social media software to help you be really in touch with your audience. Whether your audience is listening on an analog signal or a digital signal or streaming, you still want to keep in touch with your audience, make them feel good, put their pictures or their, their comments on, on social media and really take care of them. Thanks a lot to bionic.radio, Broadcast Bionics, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right, we're here with Alex and Philip, and uh, we are going to continue into our foray of, of digital audio broadcasting. Philip, I'm, 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 my mind's almost blown, but let's go ahead and just finish the job <laughs> and blow my mind some more. What you got for us? Well, I think that, that pretty much wraps up a lot of things we wanted to say. Um, you know, I, I think digital radio is here to stay. It, it adds a whole lot of new possibilities for broadcasters with visual supplement of cha of, uh, of your audio broadcast. Uh, it you know certainly increases more diversity in terms mm -hmm. of audio programming, more channels, um, and uh, I think it, it requires a bit of a rethink of what we're going to do with this techno digital technology. It's not your radio broadcast from yesteryear. Um, you know. Uh, it, it, it is going to shake things up, and uh, we're going to make it happen. Philip, would you mind going back one slide? I've just, I want to look at that a bit sure. more. Can you do that? Oh, I'm this sorry. One back, back one more slide. Uh, there we go. Okay. So, mm -hmm. Alex and Philip, help me. Under, uh, so, you, you've, you've got these different audio programs coming in a web stream. You've got something from Radio Jar, two from St. Cloud, it says. Mm -hmm. uh, so, these are your sources of program audio coming in over over the web i guess they were streaming and yep. pointed or being picked up here by this cloud porter instance yeah right? streaming encoders uh or stream receivers built into the omnia uh enterprise 9s software. oh of course okay so those are built into yep. that audio processor that for folks yep. who didn't it looks like an omnia 9 that's because it is is an omnia 9 s the software only version of an mm -hmm. omnia 9 now i'm and and then and then um we have on the right hand side of your middle graphic there this is where what your metadata uh, is handled. Is that well, right? the Gen, the Gen Four system is the the brains of how HD radio works. Oh, that's okay. the Xperia Core system. Uh, so that's where the HD One, the exporter software lives for HD One. All the metadata, HD Two, Three, and Four capture clients, the Artist Experience client. Um, if you live near an iHeart radio station, you you, you can uh, uh, they broadcast uh, traffic data. Mm -hmm. Uh, traffic maps yeah. uh, on, on receivers that you can see that with. Uh, so that's where that portion of that lives. And what Philip has uh, ingeniously come up with is the ability to link these two things together in the middle and join them at the hip so that they are 
in lockstep right from the output of the processor into what we would consider the, pro- the transmitter at that point. And it also requires a specialized uh, modulator exciter at that point that takes that IP stream and modulates it both together as well. Mm-hmm. So that's not a standard piece either. You know? So mm-hmm. there's two, two new innovations that we're bringing into on both sides of that link. Mm-hmm. And the, and the transmitter actually is calling the cloud, not the cloud calling the transmitter. Ah, okay. That Great. was what allowed yeah. us to do the failover is it had a list of where should I go. Oh, ah, IP address, port numbers, that kind of thing. Yep. Maybe it some knew, it knew It's like, hey, I lost this one. I'm going to go to the next one in my list. I, I guess uh, whether, it's not, it was not in, whether or not it was in the demo, I guess there's the possibility mm-hmm. for some secret sauce um, uh, security going on. Yes, right. absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yep. Uh, now, uh, if you can't, I, if it's proprietary, don't worry. But I'm curious about the FMMPX. It shows here m- with the cloud porter that it's all carried to the same IP stream. Uh, what is the what is the technology involved with carrying the FMMPX over this system? Well, the MPX itself is uncompressed MPX uh, all the way from the cloud. You know, d- data capacity is not an issue in the cloud. The mm-hmm. last mile could be an issue with your STL. Mm-hmm. We're looking about three megabits for the MPX here. Um, so we're, we're looking at future MPX compression techniques. Micro MPX might be uh, mm-hmm. one of those options for that link. Uh, but for the time being, we said, well, let's focus on the best we can do, uncompressed uh, PCM right out of the audio processor, uh, no changes all the way up to the FM modulation stage. So uh, with it being um, uh, a linear representation of the FM multiplex traveling along with these uh, HD data stream, where the whole modulator-ready signal there, um, uh, what what if you had a, some packet loss? Is, is there anything to mitigate that? And I realize this was, this was a demo, but mm-hmm. what's the idea there if I lose a packet here or there or 10 here or there? Well, the kind of the consideration Phil and I went with is by the time we get to this point, we're receiving off of a stream into the cloud and sending it all the way back. Real time has gone so far out the window, it's oh, in yeah. the next week. Yeah. So we buffered the snot out of both sides. <laughs> oh, and, and, and it's not a UDP connection, it's a TCP it's connection. It's TCP connection. Okay, so if, if the receiver knows, hey, I got packets uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, I'm missing 14 and 15, I'm going to ask for them again. Yep. Right? Okay, so it's TCP. Uh, uh, yeah, buffering. Yeah, big buffer. And it's the same reason why we can reach out to AWS. You know, that's why we flipped the whole thing around. Rather mm-hmm. than pushing packets into our system, we're mm-hmm. asking for packets. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. That makes that makes total sense. And do you is is this a is this a product now or still in the talking about it stage and finding out what people want to implement? Well, it's such a radical a new change in how we do things. Uh, we're, we're at the stage where we have it running on our GV transmitters, um, and uh, we're, we're looking to the next step. Uh, but I think it, it, it is still a, let's call it, a bit of a mind shift to go in this, this direction. So uh, stay tuned. So I'm, I'm look, I'm I'm no visionary, but I, I, I've been thinking about this kind of thing for a long time. For some years, you've been able to spin up a cloud instance of a, a web streaming station. For example, mm-hmm. there's there's companies that will facilitate that for yep. you. You can do it yourself if you know what you're doing. I tried it once myself. I didn't know what I was doing. But other people are, are, are doing that. And it doesn't take a whole lot more to make a radio station. Now, to this, a U.S. broadcaster doing this would need to think about things like EAS, in, in, in the emergency alerting system. How would they work that into the system? And, and uh, well, they probably put some stuff at, at the transmitter site, but I, I think there's going to be slicker things coming along in, in the future. Wow. Yeah, that, that was a challenge, and I had to remind my friends to the north, EAS is a very real thing here in, in the U.S., uh, and we've actually uh, had – there's. I won't say any names, but there's other companies who've actually were like, hey, we made this thing. It'll help for that, and we're like – Hey, let's get one of those, and that'll work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, everybody else is kind of in the same mindset to try and facilitate this uh, from the studio side. Um, you know, the, the Telus Alliance, obviously, for instance, has all of their software-based products like the IQS and the VX uh, phone system stuff. Mm-hmm. All that stuff that has gone into this virtualized world or Dockerized container world. But the transmission plant, is, uh, the one thing I can't virtualize, Kirk is the light at the top of the tower and the antenna in the tower itself, Yeah. Uh, yeah. let alone the transmitter. Those are the physical things I still need to make this work. Uh, but everything else leading up to that, you know, you take your stations in Mississippi, it would be so much nicer if you could take all of this mm-hmm. 
uh, supporting equipment and move that back to your environmentally controlled studios or even your American Samoa stations, mm -hmm. which I know are encoded right behind your shoulder. <laughs> you know, keeping that, you know, right next to the hip and all you're doing is sending this data payload down to that transmitter. And the only thing there is the transmitter. Um. Uh, I, I want to make sure I, that I say this right. Th we were talking about the diversity delay and keeping those in alignment, and this system um, makes that happen from the get-go. They can't get out of alignment. There's no, there's no two things that are racing each other here, right? Exactly. Okay. It's okay. one TCP/IP pipe, and they can't pass one another, so to speak. They, yeah. They're all in sequence. Okay. There's no jitter okay. to uh, contend with, no latency to contend with, no dropouts to contend with. They're always in the same world. Got it. Got it. Um, uh, Phil, did, did you have any more slides, or are we pretty much done at studying things at this point? We could certainly talk about many of these topics much, much longer, but uh, you know, we're pretty much, I think we've, yeah. we've got our points across. Yeah, this and, is where the future uh, is going is, you know, is, is, like I said, the cloud is someone else's computer and everybody seems to like using someone else's computer. <laughs> uh, you know, and I'm not not against it myself. Um, you know, they, Amazon and Microsoft and Google are really, really good at building data centers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Much better than a broadcaster is. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the asset versus a, a monthly bill. You know, do you want to pay to maintain several servers in the back room or several servers in several different regions for your failover and redundancies if you're a large broadcaster or a regional broadcaster well, and yeah. hire the expertise yeah. to deal with that, uh, the mm -hmm. personnel that, that knows how this system works versus – Someone like AWS, where this is what their their specialty is. Phil, if you don't mind, flip to the, the the slide that shows the map of where the data centers were that you guys experimented with. Okay, so this is where where Alex copy pasted, uh, you know, one cloud porter instance to somewhere else. I'm sure it's more than copy paste, but maybe not. Not really. Maybe not it really was just clone. <laughs> they have a clone function in AWS. Oh my goodness. So my yeah. question is, could could one of these? Uh, and I realize AWS may be its own format, but I run into broadcasters saying, "Well, I'm not going to trust you know my signal to somebody else." Well, of course mm -hmm. you you buy things on Amazon and eBay and your bank all the time. Right. Uh, you know th those seem to be pretty trustworthy. But my question would be, what if you said, "I want my primary to be a computer, a server running in my own data center, either either at my facility." Facility, or maybe the corporation, the radio group that I work with, mm -hmm. uh, has a has one or more data centers that right. are professionally managed. Could I do this in that? Absolutely. Okay. A absolutely. Okay. You can do this on premises. You could do this in the cloud. A mixture thereof, and you get to pick which one's primary, which one's backup, which one is tertiary. Um, you know, we still know as broadcasters what the real things we have to have are: content, EAS, and an antenna. <laughs> you know. <laughs> You, you know, uh, you can also, if you if you want, if your transmitter site happens to be in a wonderful protected location, mm -hmm. and I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, one of my radio stations in Mississippi right now, um, we ended up not having a morning guy anymore in the studio. We mm -hmm. ended up leasing a different building. We're not going to build a studio there until we have to. We've moved all the automation to the transmitter site. It's got good power there. Great internet connectivity because it's the head end of a wireless isp uh, mm. and and so uh we just put the automation eas everything is at the transmitter site and we just access it remotely and it works great uh, mm -hmm. voice tracking even uh even just in time semi late shows so that's mm -hmm. one example and that's small town mississippi another example though of putting this gear we're seeing here maybe at the transmitter site um our uh, our late friend chris tobin uh mm -hmm. did this during covid for WBGO, they put the automation, everything at the transmitter site, well protected uh, in the Empire State Building. Yep. Uh, so th th there's lots of, it doesn't have to be in an AWS center. This concept no. doesn't, it can be other locations. Yes, absolutely. I, I mean, right next to me is a ra two racks of equipment where I do maintain the university radio station's backup system. Uh -huh. So I have a HD multicast that in a pinch I can throw on the air mm. uh, should something fail at the transmitter site. Uh, there is a spare audio processor sitting here. There is a, a copy of the automation system running here. You know, if, if anything fails, my house is the backup because – uh, being a state university or even, you know, New York City, Empire State Building, there are times where you are locked out of those facilities. Ah, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, you can't get into ESB if 
God forbid, another 9-11 yeah, yeah. or something of that nature. I can't get into the university because of, let's say, a chemical spill or a bomb threat or something. I live here. Yeah. You know, you, you, it, it's my house. If I get kicked out of here for a reason, there better be a really good one. <laughs> uh, but the, you know, those backups is you, your transmitter site is a great one. And I realize a lot of guys aren't Empire State Building, you know, just stuff like that. You know, it, 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 it's a building in a field probably the last place you're going to want to put a computer mm -hmm. yeah, yeah um you know i've been to some very clean pristine transmitter sites i've been to some home depot sheds mm -hmm. you know the, the all walks of life of this world uh for broadcasters as such plan accordingly i mean these are computers uh no matter no matter which way you look at it you know whether it's the hd side am fm drm uh you know dab they all need a computer, a server of some kind to facilitate what they do today. Gentlemen, we're going to take one more quick break. We'll be back with your final thoughts, what people, uh, what you want our listeners to take away, what they should maybe investigate next or be thinking about or be dreaming about in the future. This week in Radio Tech, our 550th episode with Alex Hartman and Philip Schmid, both with Nautel, talking about technology and virtualization. And uh, wow, just cool stuff here. Our show is brought to you in part by our friends at Innovonics. We'll be right back. The Aaron 655 is the latest addition to the Innovonics family of rebroadcast receivers, designed specifically for FM broadcast translators, also referred to as relay transmitters. The Aaron 655 is unique as an uncompromising DSP-based HD radio and FM receiver combined with a powerful three-band audio processor and dynamic RDS encoder. IP connectivity adds streaming capabilities and a web browser interface gives you total remote control of the unit from any PC or mobile device. The Aaron 655 gives you maximum flexibility for program sources. Select program audio from analog FM, digital channels HD1 through 8, streaming sources, and analog or AES digital line inputs, all with assignable failover audio backup. The internal RDS encoder allows you to customize your RDS messaging. You can use incoming off-air RDS data, convert HD radio pad data to RDS, convert streamed metadata to RDS, or receive IP telnet data. Comprehensive audio processing includes gated and windowed AGC, a unique syllabic leveler, three bands of compression, and both wideband and independent HF limiting. Easy setup is achieved by using 10 factory presets and 10 customizable presets. The processor also supports day parting, allowing automatic preset changes to follow different programming formats throughout your broadcast day. The front panel has an OLED display and jog wheel with intuitive menus for easy setup, advanced control, and editing for all operating parameters. The Aaron 655 Dynamic Web Interface gives you total remote control of the unit from any PC or mobile device. A comprehensive set of menus includes a quick overview of now playing info, input-output control, processor options, RDS encoder, alarms and notifications, SNMP settings, and much more. You can also listen to the live audio broadcast streamed through the web interface. On the back of the Aaron 655, you've got an antenna input, left and right analog inputs and outputs, AES digital input and output, MPX output for the rebroadcast transmitter, and a network port for the IP interface. The uh, Aaron 655 is an amazing piece of equipment, uh, and if you need it as a rebroadcast receiver, that's that's what you're going to get. Uh, you can also pick up, as I said, HD2. Where you get it? From Broadcaster's General Store, BGS, Broadcaster's General Store in Ocala, Florida. You can check out their website at bgs.cc, but what they're really set up for is to talk to you on the phone. These folks have, uh, their computer systems are set up, they have the ordering and and tracking. They can tell you when your product's going to get there, or they almost always can. So check them out at 352-622-7700. 352-622-7700 for Broadcaster's General Store, and ask them about the Aaron 655. And we were talking, gentlemen, with uh, Alex and Philip about a different uh, Innovonics product. What the, this, the Justin, is that the name of it? 
The Justin 808, yes. It's and, the HD1 FM time alignment tool. And, and you're, you're, uh, you, you said you, you bought one to prove you didn't need it, but that was only for the technology that you're not selling yet. <laughs> exactly. But if exactly. you're doing any HD now, you need a Justin 808. Yes, yes. It's highly recommended. <laughs> um, doing, it, doing it by ear, you can get close, but I don't think many people can hear 68 microseconds. Huh? Uh, exactly. <laughs> uh, so, you know, those are the harder times where you... you I believe Phil even said in the webinar, it's actually better for you to be way off than not right close in mm. uh, because of that phasing and nulling yeah. issue. Yeah. So, but the Justin alleviates that. So you put it in the in line with your uh, HD signal, and it it measures the samples. You have to get close. It won't do it all for you. You got to mm. do a little bit of legwork. So you got to put a little delay in yourself, and get it close. And the Justin does the rest of the work for you. Very cool. Mm. Hey, we need to uh, uh, leave our listeners with uh, an idea. So, uh, uh, Alex, I'll hit you first. Philip, uh, the uh, guest of honor here, will hit you last. Uh, Alex, give us some kind of word of inspiration or, or, or a tip, something that you can we can uh, walk away with and be thinking about. Well, uh, you know, in the digital world, you, you have to think differently. Um, what you're doing nowadays may not work tomorrow um, or may come back the next day. Uh, you just don't know. Uh, but with the digital uh, ecosystem that we're into, you know, you, you, your automation system is digital. Uh, your transmitter may be digital. Uh, there's a lot of digital in the world. Uh, streaming, for instance, you, you got to take that seriously just the same. So be thinking kind of about where we're going in this landscape. Uh, how, how are you going to make an impact as a broadcaster uh, in the digital landscape? Um, because as we started out, analog may not be here for long. You know, and I think what dovetails into what you're saying is that, yes, streaming is becoming more and more and more of a thing. Uh, but over the air is still important. People still have car radios. You know, there's millions of cars on the road that don't have any, well, don't have any HD, but also don't have any streaming capability. So, right. uh, you know, using the technologies that are, uh, uh, yeah, if, if you're the proud owner of a license for a broadcast station, um, then you, of course, need to sound great on the air, but you need to use the other uh, facilities available to you to get your, yes. your audio Leverage out. Leverage everything. Leverage everything. That's a good phrase. Philip, uh, what would you like to leave our listeners with? What piece of advice? Well, I think, you know, broadcast radio is going to go all digital. Uh, our current state of hybrids, uh, you know, analog and digital together, I think it's only a stepping stone. Um, you know, and while we still have the analog around, we're limited by what we can do. Uh, it's really only once we get to all digital that we can really unleash some of the power of this technology. Um, and I think... You know, as we can see with all digital AM today, I think we're only a, a stone's throw away from that reality. That is a good point with the all digital AM. And you know, I don't know where that's going to go or how well it's going to do. That increase in coverage in, in the St. Pete area, Tampa, St. Pete, my goodness, from eight miles to, uh, you know, a pretty reliable 35 miles. I've been saying it for years. I think the AM revitalization plan uh, put together by Commissioner Pye and stuff like that, previous administrations, is that they're going to use the AM band with AM revitalization to try and ease their toes into a digital transition for uh, radio broadcast, they know what kind of a mess they made with the digital television trans, uh, transition back in 2009. Uh, they don't want to relive that. So they're trying to, I think, uh, and this is just personal opinion, they're easing their toes into that world where with the translators, you've moved a lot of your listeners to the FM now that the AM band, as many people like to call it, you know, I, AM revitalization wasn't uh, revitalizing the band it was abandoning it uh in time for us to figure this part out like mm -hmm. uh like neil down in tampa where he turned it on and oh wow what happened that was cool um but i think that's going to be what uh is going to be the first step i think you, you point out some proof in the pudding there with uh, increased cum and increased time spent listening Holy cow. I would not have expected that, uh, you know, because not everybody has an HD radio. A lot of people have HD radio and they don't know they have it. Exactly. <laughs> it's in the last car. So there, there is education as a broadcaster, too. You got to go to your car dealerships and, 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 you know, work your sales reps to educate your, your customers just the same that, hey, this radio works. Here's what it does. Mm -hmm. Philip, Philip Schmidt, uh, Chief Technical Officer for Nautel. Thank you so much for being with us and sharing your and vast knowledge and, uh, and the results of your experimentation and thought. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And Alex Hartman, thank you for being with us also and the practical hands-on uh, work that you do. I really appreciate the advice you give out. No problem, Kirk.
All right. I'm Kirk Harnack. This has been episode 550 of This Week in Radio Tech. Be sure you visit our um, our uh, sponsors. It really helps me out. It helps me out personally, helps the show out, and helps us uh, keep it coming to you. Max Connect Wireless, also Angry Audio, uh, Broadcast Bionics at bionic.radio, and also Broadcasters General Store at bgs.cc. And one of their vendors, of course, is Innovonics with the uh, with uh, all the all the cool products that they make, which you can get uh, demos on right online. All right, we'll be back next week with another great show of This Week in Radio Tech. Tell your friends. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.